and now I am uh, I'm spending more of my time as uh, in developing solutions, cloud-based solutions uh, for planning, better planning, and better monitoring of wells. So um, today I'll be tr I'll try to discuss with you uh, how to get a digital outlook towards drilling problems. Drilling has been vastly vastly a very analog um, industry where you know it's a hands-on thing and it's more of a practical thing in reservoir you can simulate in production as well you get the flow and even that is more of like a practical thing so digital is completely unless you drill the well you have no idea what's going on so you need to drill the well in order to get the oil out so um Jeff Bezos has mentioned that there is no alternative to digital transformation. Visionary companies will carve out new strategic options for themselves. Those that don't adapt will fail. So this is a very, this is a very bold statement, but it is actually unfortunately true. If we all do not adapt ourselves towards a digital lookout of every aspect of our life, not just the professional uh, aspect, but even our personal life, we it will be very hard for us to survive as the world is moving progressively towards digital aspects. So what does digital mean? First of all, let's understand that. I mean, you all are petroleum engineers, so I'll touch the petroleum engineering topic a little later. But first of all, let's think about what does digital mean? Now, going digital can mean different to everyone. And um, I know if, if I allow all of you to speak right now, it might become a little bit busy because uh, it's virtual. If you want, you can write it in the chat, but I'm going to give you like 30 seconds to think about it. To you, what does digital mean? And you can write one word or you can write more words if you want. So you can start writing now in the chat and I would love to hear your feedback. What it means. And it, there's no wrong answer in there. So please go ahead, start typing in your answers in the chat if you can, uh, as to what does digital mean to you as a person? I'm going to start a little timer on my clock here. Okay, new version of life. Great. Automation. All right. Great. Very good points. New version of life. That's a very good lookout for additional. I like that. Automated drilling. Yes. Correct. Yes, automated drilling. That's exactly. Uh, and you're gonna achieve. You're gonna more accurate. Yes, that's very true. Because analog can be problematic. All right, my thirty seconds are over. Uh, you can continue writing. I mean, change life things at work. It's a plan for your project. Awesome, great point. We can all we can call data as digital when it comes from any software computer. That's an excellent point, Ahmed. Uh, you can call it digital when it comes from any software. So. Uh, I wrote down a few things that I came up with uh, when I was preparing this. Uh, what does digital mean? Recording information as a number, uh, Elak, that's a very good point because then what you have said here is extremely important because you have just said that I'm converting something which is in words, a string or a text or something which is subjective into something as objective as a number, a fixed number, good or bad. I got stuck bad. So that's a negative point there. So that's a good point. So digital means you need to save time. It leads some meaningful data, meaningful information. It's a driver for change. A change it should drive something. I mean, you, you, know, you should not just go digital for the sake of going digital. It should mean something. It, can, it will change the way you look at things. Mobility, you know, you can look at your phone, you can look at your iPad, you can look at the screen, wherever you want. Safety, security, that's also important. Uh, helps in simulating scaling scenarios. If I'm going digital with my reservoir simulation, I should be able to scale it up or simulate that reservoir over the entire field and not just a small four by four grid area. Uh, create value for business or the client, doesn't matter who you're working for. Uh, helps at foundational level. Digital should change the core work of your life, like what you, uh, I think, uh, Mr. Bavar, you said that new version of life. So it should change the way you work inherently. It should not be just superficial on the top. No, it should completely change the way you look at things. 
finally automation and that was thing that also so you, you, a lot of you already mentioned a lot of these things in some way in some form or the other and i'm glad you guys you all of you are thinking in that direction because that's also uh, important that you should know what digital means now uh, i think um, mr barber you have a question Okay, can I, uh, if you don't mind, can I please mute Mr. Barwa? Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Um, that's all right. I mean, uh, it's virtual. These things happen. That's all totally fine. Uh, there's a comment here uh, by Mr. Mohammed. I think uh, it refers to something that involves or relates to the use of computers or electronic technology to process, store, and transmit data in the form of discrete signals or numerical representations. Very good point, uh, Mr. Mohammed. Uh, it's 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 a direct meaning of being digital. Now, uh, let's look at what digital drilling incorporates in drilling industry we have three major aspects when we whenever we are working as a drilling engineer one is the planning aspect so we look at a huge amount of data so a data can mean uh, subsurface data which means what are the formations pore pressure factor pressures um, th geothermal gradients that we are looking at uh, then we are looking at surface data. Where are we going to drill? Is it onshore, offshore? If it is offshore, what is the water depth? Is the soil okay, compact enough that we can settle down? Is it a platform rig or is it a floating rig? Uh, if it is onshore, where am I? Am I on top of a mountain or am I in the middle of a lake? I cannot drill in the middle of a lake, so I need to move. So there is surface data, subsurface data, and data management of this information. It's humongous information that's coming from these two sources. Once we take these two sources, surface and subsurface, let's say you are able to bring this information in. You need to prepare the trajectory, how you're going to start from the surface or location all the way down to your subsurface targets, how we are going to achieve that. So directional drilling comes into picture. Casing policy that will reflect based on your pore pressure and formation and geothermal gradients. Casing design, what, what size of casing, what weight and grades of casing are you going to use? So there are many aspects of planning that inherently involve a lot of data on its own. And this all, if it is digital, of course, it's going to help you. Now then comes the execution part where you're actually drilling. Now here, Almost the same aspects as you had in planning will reflect, but they are happening in real time. So cementing, BHA, what kind of BHA are you going to use? What is the torque and drag you're experiencing? So you can actually simulate torque and drag beforehand using some software, and then you're going to see whether your calculations and your assumptions were right or not. Hydraulics, string, BHA dynamics, swab and search, drilling through. You, you prepare a drilling program by the end as an engineer, whenever all of you will join a company as a drilling engineer, you will have to create finally what is called as a drilling program. And drilling program will be kind of like a step-by-step -step guide for the person on the rig site that they will follow in order to drill that well. So drilling program and plans, you will get rig reports as a feedback. So whenever you are drilling every day, you will be getting reports rig reports, drilling reports, mud reports, mud logging reports, cementing reports, bunch of reports. The drilling engineer, you will have to assimilate all this information, keep, keep it somewhere which is handy for you or which is, uh, how do I say it? Either it is handy or it is in a digital format or whatever format you want. Finally, a feedback loop. Now, this is also very important and this is something which is actually missing in many places all over the world. This, this becomes very difficult. How do you translate the reports that you're getting from the rig site back to the planning phase? So that you're saying that, okay, I designed this well, I drilled this well, my assumptions were actually horribly wrong, and I should have actually assumed the friction factor of so-and-so number, and I saw they're very high. So as a feedback, the next well which I'm going to drill I should be increasing my friction factor. I should be increasing my mud weight and change my trajectory style or whatever the feedback comes from there. So this is something that uh, this is something that that's very important for us to get a feedback from. 
from here. Now, like I said, drilling industry has three aspects, planning, execution, and feedback. And let us, we'll, we'll try to go over these as the digital aspects of all these. I'm not going to go into how do we plan, how do we execute, how do we do a feedback loop, but let's try to envision how a digital drilling will look like, <clears throat> a digital aspect of drilling will look like, and what does it mean to go digital, keeping these three up. Uh, keeping these three in mind in, in the background. Now, before we go ahead with drilling, I want to take a quick example of how digital transformation can impact an industry. Uh, this, I love this example, which is a marketing example. So uh, traditional marketing challenge, the left-hand side most column is traditional marketing challenge. So traditional, let's say print materials. It's very common. You, 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 would, uh, you would see in newspapers, you know, People present ads in newspapers or pamphlets or brochures or they stick posters everywhere. And there is a huge cost involved in printing those posters or presenting an ad in newspaper. Digital marketing channel converts it into a digital material, which is you know just an image on the computer, which can be sent via Facebook or social network or any other media that you want. So it reduces the cost of printing and distribution, its ability to score and grade prospects based on digital interactions. So it becomes very easy for companies to interact, like just like what we are doing right now. If you would have invited me to your university, which I would have loved to come in person, but you can imagine like I would be traveling, there is a time difference. I would be spending a large amount of time from moving from here, Dallas, all the way to Iraq, then coming to a university, staying at least one night beforehand and staying up for the uh, lecture. Next day, I'll be leaving back or I'll de definitely love to walk around and visit around your places. So it will consume a lot of our time. What could, what can finish, what can we finish like one and a half, two hours would have taken like three or four days. So it's a huge difference. Print mail campaigns. You, we used to get brochures and we still used, to, we are still get brochures in our mails. Uh, which is again a huge cost to companies. People do that, but then email campaigns are much better. Facebook are much better. Uh, print billboard advertisements, people still do that. I'm not saying there's a bad way of communication, but social media advertising can be very selective. Very selective. So if I so don't, if like, I don't anyone, like any any one particular product, I can actually go ahead and choose not to see that ad and they will not send me that ad. But if I like one particular product, they will send me that ad. So uh, brick and mortar storefront, you have to build a proper shop to sell your products, website and e-commerce, you just need a warehouse maybe. You just keep the stuff in the warehouse and then with websites and e-commerce, you just ship it whenever you want. Nobody is coming to your store, so you don't need to have a proper uh, place for that. Uh, loyalty club cards, mobile apps. I love this, like uh, here in US, Walmart, Kroger, Costco. Uh, I don't need to carry my card every, anywhere. I can just use my phone whenever I want to. So it reduces the sign up friction, reduces the cost of printing, it reduces a lot of things. And companies have changed, have transformed themselves inherently. It's not just that they're doing it superficially. No, they have changed the way they function. They have changed the way they work. There is a lot going on in this industry now. So there's a lot more you can do when you have gone digital. So let's come back to drilling now know your stuff now this is i love this part because this is a quote i found online and i don't know who said it but this is of the perfect thing to define a digital transformation it's not about technology it is about people so always keep this in mind digital transformation is not about how good you can use your phone how good you can use your computer how good you can code in Python or Java or, or any other language? Are you great with SQL database or not? Doesn't matter. That's not about technology. It's about people. It's about you. You need to come as a drilling engineer, come up with a question and a solution saying that, hey, I have this problem. Can I solve this using the current means or do I need to switch to a digital transformation technique and then it would be helpful for me? So that's the question you need to ask. Don't worry about the technology. There are people who are doing computer science degrees and electronics and communication degrees who that's their job. They're literally paid for that. You people are petroleum engineers. You are being paid for something else. So don't worry about the technological part. Worry about the, worry, worry about you, worry about your, your aspect. So you need to know your stuff. So, all right, 
let's think let's think about it uh drilling has been going on for almost 100 years now we have been drilling for oil now obviously at some point of time maybe in 60s or 70s some some guy must have said hey i want to have a smarter real time drilling experience I'm on the rig floor and I have to go from one gauge to another gauge. I have to look at the, my weight indicator. I have to look at my uh, pressure sensor. I have to look at my RPM sensor. I have to look at my torque sensor. I'm jumping from one field to another area. And like, can I have a smarter experience? Yeah, of course you can. So let's let's see what, what's going on when you're drilling. When you're drilling, these are the seven main parameters that we're looking at. Now, I know many of you might have already been to drilling rigs. Some of you may already have some experience in internships or actually may have done some jobs. There are more parameters now, of course, but back in the days, 70s, 80s, these were the seven most important parameters for a drilling engineer to understand. And there is a reason I'm saying only these seven, and you will come to know just in, in the next slide why I'm saying these seven parameters. So weight on bit, hook load, pressure, pump speed, torque, RPM, and hook position. These seven were very important for a drilling engineer to understand no, no, why no. seven now the reason why there was seven is because initially when we had we had analog sensors which means just a dial gauge so you know like a Borden tube pressure gauge or a martin decker weight indicator it tells you the weight and you have to be in front of the dial to look at the number what's going on there now uh, like I said, the drilling engineer is jumping or the company man is jumping from one place to another place looking at all these sensors. And this, they must have asked, hey, I need a smarter way to do this. This is not working out. I'm just walking too much unnecessarily. So they came up with something which, is, which was called a seven pen recorder. And this was state of the art technology at that point of time. It was literally a huge piece of roll inside a machine. That machine had seven pens in it. And it used to uh, the, the, the pen used to move left or right depending on the data that it is receiving from weight indicator, weight on bit, hook load, pressure, pump speed, and those seven parameters I told you about. So that's why it's called a seven pen recorder. And it was a state of the art at that point of time. And what you can do is you can now look at that paper and see what, what was going on. So it was so what happened was here that you were not just looking at instantaneous numbers of pressure and, and hook load. You are looking at the history or the trend of that sensor or pressure sensor or hook load. What has happened to it? So there was a lot more insight coming from it. Slowly, we evolved into digital sensors. And this was a huge revolution. Our sensors became digital, which means that I just need to put that sensor somewhere and then I can just need to lay an electrical cable some, wherever I want. Electrical cables are easy to carry. Now I can take them anywhere throughout the rig and I can display that digital number wherever I want. And that was a huge, huge change in the way people were working. This some, I think maybe happened somewhere in the 80s and 90s uh, when slowly all sensors started becoming digital. Now, since I have a digital sensors, I can convert that into a real-time screen on a computer. So instead of having a seven pen recorder sheet, which is giving me numbers, squiggly lines on a paper, I just have a computer screen, which is again giving me squiggly lines, but it's very useful for me. Now, since I have the RT screen or the real time screen, I can look at what's going on and what has been happening for the past 10, 12, 15, 24 or 100 hours. I can now transmit that information to anywhere I want in the world. Maybe it could be just in the next room, you know, let's in the company man room, or it could be in the drilling engineer's room. Uh, companies nowadays have a real-time operating centers in their own offices, a huge dedicated office, a room where drilling engineers are sitting 24 seven, and they're just observing the data coming in from the rig side, and they're evaluating whether it is going good or bad. Now, with this real-time data transmission, then comes the real-time intelligence. I'm looking at a screen. I'm understanding what's going on. I can make out that, okay, this, there's some change in the pressure trend happening here. Um, that could be something wrong. Why, why is the pressure dropping suddenly? Or why is the pressure dropping slowly as we're drilling? The pressure is continuously dropping. Something is not right. So something is not right here. So that's the intelligence that came along with that. And this intelligence, the reason I'm saying intelligence here after data transmission is because 
it's not any more that the person sitting on the rig only that person has an idea of what is going on at the rig the drilling engineer sitting in the office maybe hundreds of miles away also has a unique look at what is happening at the rig and this is very powerful i'm can getting live data for that rig finally ai ml forecasting now this is a new trend that is coming up slowly many companies are building on top of it where you are getting live information from the rig site but you are converting you are using artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms to understand the trend of that so that they can forecast or tell you beforehand hey you are going to get into trouble this is not right so let's let's take a look how so i show, i told you the evolution of how digitization has changed the way drilling rigs used to perform we were at a place where there were just analog sensors only the drilling engineer the driller or the company man on the site only they have a idea what is going on and they only have an idea what is going on at that particular time only we went from that situation all the way down where we are sitting hundreds, said, of, miles hundreds away, of miles away and we can uh, we can figure out still figure out what is going on wrong with the rig so let's take a look how this can change the way and because you all will be coming into in the industry and uh, you you will be able to uh, understand you should be able to understand what's going on so let's take a scenario okay let's let's go a couple of scenarios uh, i'll i'll give you three aspects of the scenario i'll give you what is going on right now okay so observation with or without digitization so you are at the rig site and you observed something the observation is there is a sudden reduction in hook load suddenly your hook load dropped sudden drop in pump pressure and increase in pump rate so you observed two things there was a sudden reduction in hook load your weight went down and the pump pressure uh, suddenly pump pressure went down and the pump started pumping faster what might have gone wrong now if you are at the rig site you're looking at analog sensors this is what you observe um there is one thing that comes to my mind that maybe you have a drilling mud cut you did not tighten your joints drill pipe joints properly and what happened was you uh, your mud started pressuring out of one of the connections and it eventually led to parting of your drill pipe now this is happening when i when you are just looking at the analog sensors you have no look out of the history let's see what what will happen if you bring a little bit of intelligence and uh, you're looking at the history of what is going on so you will see that there is a trend of declining pump pressure because the mud is not going all the way down to the drilling bit it's actually bypassing from somewhere on the top slowly the pump pressure will keep on declining because it's not observing the pressure from the bit nozzle so you will if you had the real time screens you would be seeing this trend now you can figure out that there is a mud cut string from here or you can go even one step further and you can train an ai ml algorithm to tell you that hey i see this trend in declining pump pressure and i have seen this happening in some other places as well this always leads to mud cut string i suspect you have a mud cut string pull out of hole and check and if you do that if you if you look at the situation if you just come if you're just looking at an analog data you have lost the string because the weight suddenly went down so you have already lost the string when you pull out of hole your half of the string will be gone but in in this situation where you are you are observing a declining trend and in this situation where the artificial the machine learning model itself identifies the trend and warns you before even you may be will able to notice the trend in this situation you can save your string you can save your entire well you will not get stuck so that is the intelligence that is the smartness that comes with the digital change if we would have stayed in the analog mode we would never have come up with it the seven pen recorder also is not that great seven pen recorder is very hard to read you cannot read that piece of paper all the time using more digitization and bringing some intelligence maybe even machine learning techniques you can bring in much more better adaptability or much better intelligence 
let's look at another situation here. Um, you observe that the tanks, the mud tanks are getting lower in volume. Okay, so you are pumping the mud continuously and you have mud tank level. And obviously what goes in comes out. So the same volume that goes in has to come out. So your mud tank should always be at the same level. You can never have a higher level of mud, mud, mud here. But you are seeing that the mud tanks are going down volume. Returns are low with pumps on. Even when you are pumping the mud, maybe you are pumping at, let's say, uh, whatever, uh, 200 gallons per minute, but you are getting back maybe like 100 gallons per minute. You're getting very less amount back. And pump pressure is fluctuating. It's going up and down. The pressure is fluctuating. Now, I'm pretty sure most of you have already guessed what it is. It's a loss circulation zone. You have hit a loss circulation zone. Now, what could have changed? Let's say this loss zone was not a sudden fracture opening. It was something that was that uh, thief zone. Exactly, Mr. Yahoo. So you have a thief zone. Let's say this thief zone was not something like a huge fracture of limestone or dolomite, which opened up, but this was something that was slowly absorbing more and more and expanding. What would you have seen in that situation? You would have seen a trend of declining pump pressure. You would have seen a trend of declining pit volume, right? You would have seen that pit volume is going down. Now, if you would have introduced that algorithm of machine learning or AI based, which is able to identify that trend much faster than even you can figure out what is going on, there you go. You have a forecasting technique. More than that, forget even forecasting. This is usually a formation based, like Mr. Yakub just said, it's a thief zone. It's a subsurface problem. So if you would have planned better your execution and your feedback loop, if it was better through digitization, you can actually plan accordingly and say, hey, this will, I know you will encounter a thief zone at one particular zone, whatever that depth could be, 8,000 feet, 5,000 feet. And you can be better prepared for that. AI ML algorithm can also do that while drilling. It can warn you, hey, you are about to hit that formation, which is a thief zone and you will lose mud. So think about it. If, it, if you were just going analog, you just were looking at the numbers in front of you, you would have, it would have been very hard for you to you know, jump around, keep a track of what is going on, looking at the data, looking, uh, talking to the geologists, it becomes very hard. But having a digital trend in front of you just changes everything. Now, uh, let's look at scenario three. Uh, you suddenly see the drilling has slowed down. You were drilling at a certain pace and suddenly the drilling went down. Uh, there is an erratic torque. So your bit spins sometimes really fast and then suddenly it slows down. You see high torque on your motor or high torque on your, uh, on your rotary table and then suddenly it goes away. And on the shale shaker, you are seeing sticky clay. Now, I'm pretty sure most of you have already guessed what this is. It's a stick slip situation. It's a shale, exactly, Mr. Yakub. It's a shale. It's a sticky shale. I'll be a little bit more, ac uh, a little bit more uh, accurate here. Uh, stuck pipe, maybe it can lead to stuck pipe. Uh, uh, whoever wrote from the SP Koya chapter uh, login. It can lead to stuck pipe, but for now, you are seeing an erratic torque and you are seeing sticky shale on, shale, uh, on your shale shaker. So that means you have a shale situation. Now, if you had seen a trend, the moment you had hit that sticky shale formation, you would have seen a decrease in ROP. You would have seen erratic torque immediately coming up and you would have seen a slight increase in pump pressure because that sticky clay actually, most of the time, chokes up your bit. It just gets stuck on that bit and on the nozzle and it usually creates a less restrictive flow. Now, if I look at NAIML forecasting, again, the trend of decreasing ROP, the trend of erratic torque, the trend of slight increment in pump pressure, AI and ML algorithms can identify those trends very minutely, even before you can. More than that, I mean, like I said, just like thief zone, this, if this information is properly conveyed back to you while planning, in planning phase itself, in your drilling program itself, you can have that marker in there that, hey, at this depth or around this depth, please be careful because you will enter a sticky clay situation. And, you know, there, there are ways to uh, mitigate that. There are chemicals you can use to, to mitigate that. So digitization not just only is helping you in, in identifying the trend, but also warning you beforehand. Now let's 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 look at this last one scenario. 
and I'm sure most of you would guess what's going on here. Uh, this is your observation. You see a drilling break. A drilling break means suddenly the ROP has gone high. You were drilling at maybe you know what 50 feet an hour, and suddenly your ROP went up to like 100 or 150 feet an hour. Your pumps have gone down on pressure. You see very low pressure on a pump. You see a high pump rate. Pumps have started working really fast now. And MUD engineers is reporting overflowing shale shaker and gain in pit volume, influx precisely. Uh, cave zone, not so much, Mr. Yaku, because uh, I understand what you're saying. Actually, you're not wrong. From the drilling break, you, you were right uh, that you would think that it's a cave zone. And that's actually, in fact, and a sudden increase in ROP is called as a drilling break, which simply means stop drilling, put a break on your drilling. You are going too fast than you are supposed to. So it could mean anything. It could mean a cave zone. It could mean an influx. It could mean many things. As you're going deeper, your drilling should slow down, not increase up. So that's your, your, it's a reverse trend you're observing. Something is wrong here. So now that I've said, you are, your, oh, your shale shaker is overflowing with mud. There's just too much return coming up. You're, you're gaining in pit volume. You have an influx. Now, if there is an intelligence in there, you would see a trend of gradual increase in ROP. You would see a trend in decrease in pressure. You would see a trend in increase in pump rate. You would see a trend. Uh, maybe there is a video on the shale shaker. You can already see that it's flowing outwards and you can observe the increase in pit volume as a trend also. Now, these things as trends can be observed very easily. And if there's an AI ML, they can even track it faster. There are solutions already available out there in the market where if you connect them to your real-time feed of rig site, they can forecast or they can identify those trends of influx that you can get. Now, this is actually a huge change in the way people work. Influx is a very dangerous situation where you are, you are not supposed to come into this situation ever if you want. Now, um, of course, the algorithm can also identify the formation data and tell you beforehand that, hey, this formation is about to come up in, in front of you where you might see an influx. So just be careful, make sure your mud weight is higher or you are very cautious while you are drilling. Um, well, primarily, usually what they do is they just raise the mud weight higher before they enter that formation. So that usually is the best bet to go for. Uh, so we saw four scenarios in which you can identify the trend not just look at that one instantaneous moment of time, what has happened, but uh, you, you can also identify at the trend. And once you have the data in digital format, it can be fed to any AIML alg alg algorithm as well. Now, I'm using here a real-time data sample. Uh, probably a lot of you might have already seen this kind of chart somewhere. I'm using an open source information. So this is not something from a company because these are very restrictive. This is a very restrictive data. So this is from an open source uh, company. Uh, this is how you will get the real-time data from RigSite. A lot of squiggly lines. That's all it is. And you have to make sense out of that squiggly line, what's going on. And that's why I'm saying that many times looking at the squiggly line all day can maybe lead you to... You, you, may, you may not identify the trend that you, are, you want to focus on. You may not be able to identify that. So that's why there's these machine learning algorithms or setting alarms, setting limits. Whenever the hook load goes above this value, please warn me. Whenever the torque goes above this value, please warn me. So these softwares, they always come with these alarms and limits that can help you um, not look at the squiggly lines all day, but at least you can focus when, you know, management by exception. Whenever there's an exceptional case, then you go and look at what's going on wrong. Now, here you can see this, this is this is a very interesting part. Nowadays, they have chromatographs on the shale shaker. So you can identify the gas, the amount of gas, what type of gas is coming up. So they have already marked here certain places where you have, uh, number one, uh, you have swab gases, you have pump off gases. Now, let's say at every, every time you make a connection, because your pump is shut down, your ECD goes down, 
So you may get a small amount of gas, not an influx, but a small amount of gas is brought into the formation. And whenever you start the pump, after the lag time is done, you will see that connection gas. So you have to make sure that you identify this connection gas on its own and not confuse it with an actual influx. But a lot of connection gas over and over and over again can actually lead to a problem because then you have too much gas columns in your formation. Uh, same goes with swab gas. Whenever you are pulling out of hole, you need you always swab some gas like a piston. And that's why it causes a problem. Then you see a swab gas whenever you go down and whenever you are pumping out or you are breaking the gel, you will see a small amount of swab gas available. Now, this real-time information can be in two ways. This is a time-based information that's coming in. This, and this data can be like every second, every two seconds, every five seconds. This is a depth-based data. Now, uh, right, Mr. Yago, leading to kick. Uh, this is a depth-based data where the usually the softwares are able to do that. Uh, the WITSML data that's coming in from the rig side, the live data coming from the rig site, actually is, um, is time-bound, but it has a component of depth in it. So what usually the softwares that are given to the users to use, they can convert that into depth-based information. So for every depth, you always have a unique hook load, a unique weight on bit and drilling what, what parameters you were using to drill that particular depth. So it will bring that information and you can see a much more cleaner line, maybe a much cleaner way to look at the information. And you can see that your swab gas, your pump of gas and your connection gas all were coming from the same depth. Okay, that means there may be something wrong in this formation. There may be a place I may have to think about it. So this gives you a a different insight. And now think about it. I'm, I'm not going to focus on what these charts read right now, but think about the situation that going digital did not just change the way you work and think, saying that, oh, okay, yeah, whenever the pressure goes down and the ROP goes up, that means it's an influx. No, 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 no. It's not just that. You can now look at the trend. There might be something else that is causing you influx. You have connection gas, swab gas, pump off gas that's happening. Maybe you in, you were drilling so fast that you and you were doing uh, you, 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 wild connection, you were swabbing in and out so fast that you ended up getting a huge number of columns of gas in your entire well. And that led to a kick scenario. You were just, I mean, drilling fast is good, but maybe you were drilling so fast and you were so close to your pore pressure that it ended up causing an influx situation. You could have avoided that by just looking at the trend and understanding what's going on. So this is the way in which you can change the way you think, the change the way you work. Now, there's something I presented to you from, from a real time aspect. Now, a lot of folks from you, a lot of people will join big operator companies as drilling engineers and uh, you will be a big task for you guys would also be how to plan a well, how to design a well. And your manager or your boss in a couple of months down the lane, couple of years down the lane, might come and ask you, hey, you have been with this company for so many years or months or whatever. I want to improve my drilling engineer's planning performance. This is the problem statement your boss gave to you. Or let's say you yourself ask this question in front of the entire meeting. Hey, let's improve the way we plan the wells, okay? Now, um, giving you a scenario here, you have, let's say two to five drilling engineers in each project. When I say project, usually it means like you, in, in, uh, you may have some people working in the Kurdistan region, some people working in the Southern region, some people working in the Eastern region, some people working uh, in the Mediterranean Sea. So you have various projects working on. There are like five drilling engineers in each project. Uh, trainings are available. If you want, you have a new fresh drilling engineer coming out of college, maybe just like you folks are going to be going in. Uh, you can have, you can provide them trainings. All engineers have either bachelor's or master's degree available. Some developers are available in-house, which means inside the company where uh, you can ask them to develop something. Like I said, you guys are not computer science folks. You are petroleum engineer. If you know coding, great, amazing. Do learn that. But 
if you don't know that's just okay you you have some developers available and drilling softwares are also available for purchase now again i'm going to ask you guys if you can write in the chat what is the approach you want to take what are the next questions you would want to ask your boss or your colleagues as to as a response i want to improve my drilling engineer's planning performance what would you need to do this task to even begin this task i'm going to give you like maybe this time i'm going to give you like a minute or so uh, you can type in the chat and uh, I'll, i'll wait for all of you to respond back on this and we can talk about it later as well uh, we can do it in the q and a session but i'll just uh, if you guys can type something in that would be great or let me just give you yeah uh, mr babar go ahead I see your hand is up uh, good afternoon sir i hope you doing well uh, i have another question about the ai and ml, uh, ML uh, force case team mm -hmm. uh, what are the tools or equipment or the software you use in uh, your company for ai and ml trans uh, force case team uh, can you repeat your question one more time please what is that tools or equipment or software mm -hmm. you use mm -hmm. in your company okay for for ai okay okay thank you all right all right uh, i'm going to ask that some one minute is over and i'm going to uh, i'll answer to that mr babar and i'll uh, i'll cover both aspects of your question if your question was actually for me or if that question was for the problem statement i presented i'll cover both the aspects so first of all mr ibrahim you said if i said add additional process maybe i lost my job no you will not lose the job actually you will be given full support and you will be rewarded companies want to go digital the problem where uh, well i should not say lose a job the problem where the company has a problem is spending too much money that's where companies don't like it they want everything for free and i and i have i'm in a service company right now and i know like people reach out to me and say that uh, give me things for free i cannot give them for free because money was i spent money to build that software why would i give it for free to anyone but anyway that's a different point of view uh but no don't think at all that if you go for a digital process you may lose it. that will never happen that will never ever happen uh the question the approach that you can take uh, new improved software and old data near that area that's that's excellent point mr yakub what you said there new improved software and old data near that area you need that old data near that area okay let me tell you mr yakub yes there is old data available uh, it's in that room right next to your where you sit so there is a room right next to it go in there there are huge shelves and you have all the well reports and files printed properly in files and folders you can find wells all the way back to you know 1970s printed out nothing is digital now would you even dare to enter that room and go over all those dusty collection of reports you 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 may go for a few days but then you will not you know like this is a waste of time i'll never be able to scan all these items and put the data manually and that's the problem that people have somebody has to go in that room and get that data out some people are doing that right now there are some people who are actually doing this work so uh people are using ai ml techniques you scan it and the document automatically identifies what is written in that and it translates into some digital format which you can actually use but offset data is extremely important and having the offset data in digital format is also important it's equally important just having offset data may not be a great approach so yes you need an improved software but you also need the offset data to have a better planning because that feedback will not be over until you see the offset data uh, to improve my drilling engineer's planning performance i will prepare a risk assessment in the workplace excellent point a risk assessment in the workplace implement digital tools for data monitoring excellent point implement digital for data monitoring and that's exactly what we were looking at you know real time data monitoring or even uh, old data monitoring but the risk assessment aspect of it what you have what you place here um i'll ask you like think about it further 
you you will add risk assessment okay risk how how would you evaluate a risk what do you mean a risk i'm telling you to drill a well let's say in north kurdistan what's the risk there what's the problem uh, and if you come yeah please go ahead I mean, maybe it's uh, like all the problems that are related to the drilling like uh, a kick problem maybe how do you know that influx. how do you know how do you know that uh, i think if i'm if i'm not wrong kurdistan has h2s issues Yeah, I'm not because I know my S2S. friend. Yes, it has two. My friend worked there, and he told me there was a there was used to be. A, so okay, you you know by hearsay, and you heard me say that my friend has told me, and you can tell someone that hey, uh, yeah, but it's maybe H two S H two. How do you know how much H two S? How much H two S is dangerous? You don't know that. How much H two S comes out of? You don't know that. How would you know that? Well, because we have no data. <laughs> you have no data that's all fun you have to go in that dusty old room and find those files read all the ddrs and find that h wherever h2s has been mentioned if you had that data in digital format you would have just pressed control f and searched for h2s that's all you had to do or maybe machine learning could have identified wherever the h2s is or you could have had database so see going digital changes the way you are working you no longer have to walk into a room you can just sit on your desk and still have access to all that data so this could be a problem whenever you guys and keep this in mind whenever you guys go to an industry you would be surprised that not uh, even big big companies i'm not going to say the names but huge companies also have this problem where the entire data is not digital and entire data is not available at your fingertips it's not it's siloed in some maybe printed out format or even if it is scanned even if that document dusty old room all the documents have been scanned it is scanned it's an image nobody has ever bothered to read that image and translate into even an excel file like i'm 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 just throwing it out even an excel file there is no database that carries that information and that it would that can be your starting point you can ask if somebody says they want to improve a drilling engineer's planning performance okay where is the data where is the data for uh, for offset wells where is the data for the wells that we have drilled let's say in past 10 years okay don't tell me about 20 30 years even in past 10 years even in past 5 years is there data available if it is great let's start with that let's use that as a starting point and maybe you can identify a trend there so this is where you guys will have to probably start getting data becomes the first crux but again like i said the technology is not that the technology is not the problem here if is the data available in excel or microsoft access database or a sql database or an oracle database or in some other database doesn't matter that's a different question is the data available or not where i can search quickly where i can query quickly and i can get a response back then i can use any technology i want i can i can use some python script i can use some uh, r script that that's totally up to me i mean whatever i want to use so this is where you guys come in this is where you drilling just come in where you need to ask that question on your own now this this is the last part of my slide and i'm going to answer a question mr bawar i know i haven't asked you the question currently but i will answer that so uh, just bear with me for a few more minutes why is an idea important why is it that i'm stressing that you guys first of all need to understand that what is the important question that you need to ask as a drilling engineer or as a petroleum engineer to your boss Uh, as to what is it that you want to achieve not just in drilling in reservoir production wherever uh, why is an idea important so that why why is your also important so i'm going to give you an example of gps global positioning system uh, i'm not talking about the ones in your phone your phone is not a gps actually i'm talking about the real deal the real gps that's out there so uh, gps works uh, it was developed several years back uh, it was developed you, you have satellites that are hovering over the earth at at any point in earth you have at least four satellites around you and those satellites they triangulate your position precisely wherever you are so whenever you are walking those satellites are marking you whenever you are walking here and there and they know your position precisely uh, uh i think if if i'm not on the us army was the ones who who invented this first and they tried it out so the funny thing was they invented it 
it worked perfectly. They it, they turned on the GPS and it the satellites were in the space and they it showed precise location of that person. Great, everybody was happy. The next day, the engineers noted a approximately 10 kilometer error. They did not understand why. The wherever they were standing, the GPS was 10 kilometers off. The satellite or the computer system was saying that you are standing 10 kilometer away from wherever you are holding your GPS device. The next day that increased to 20 kilometer. The next day it increased to 30 kilometers. Every day it was going, it was increasing further and further. Nobody had any idea why that is happening. They had to reset the entire thing every time this happened. Now, people were still thinking about it. They did not know what to do. In the end, someone uh, referred back to Einstein's general and special theory of relativity. GPS was in, invented in 1970s, I guess 1960s, 1970s. Einstein gave theory of relativity 1900s, early 1900s. As per, as per the special theory of relativity, the, the satellites are moving at 14,000 kilometers per hour speed. We are just standing still. So as per the special theory of relativity, their speed is much closer to the speed of light so for them, this clock is slowing down by seven microseconds per day. Second point, we are closer to the Earth's gravity than the satellites are. So we are closer to the Earth's uh, curvature in the space-time fabric. We are more closer to that. We are more deeper in that curvature as compared to satellites. So the clock advances by 45 microseconds per day. If you have seen interstellar, you would know this concept. Now, oh, I don't know how this doodles came in. I don't know why this is happening. Anyway, uh, the net result, the satellite clock ad is advancing 38 microseconds per day, which leads to 10 kilometer per day error in GPS. So think about it. When Einstein gave his theory of relativity, he was not thinking this will help in GPS someday. When people in GPS were working, they were not thinking that Einstein's theory of relativity will ever apply to them. They just made the GPS. Some person thought about that idea. If they had not invented GPS, if that person, that engineer had not thought that maybe let's, let's try this out. Maybe if that, that person did not ask the question why this is happening and he did not understand how satellites work, where satellites work, how far away in the gravity they are, they would have never been able to invent GPS. We would have never received GPS. You would have never even heard of this thing. It would have died out immediately. Now, every time there's a GPS in anything in this world, every GPS on earth has an atomic clock which deliberately advances 38 microseconds per day to match with satellite GPS or vice versa. You can have a satellite which slows down the clock by 38 microseconds per day. Doesn't matter. I mean, now you know the problem. So you can put that configuration in the atomic clock wherever you want. In the GPS or in the satellite, wherever you want, you can do that. That's, that's doable. But think about it. Next time, whenever you are flying in a plane or, or you are in a ship or any place where GPS is being used, whenever your, your plane is landing, you're landing at the correct spot thanks to that one person who thought about this. That is why I'm saying knowing your stuff is important. Knowing what you are doing is important. Only you can ask those relevant questions as drilling engineers, as petroleum engineers, in order for someone to respond back using some mathematical tool or using some engineering tool. That can be done by anyone. That's from my side. I'm open to any questions. Well, let me first take up Mr. Bawar's uh, question. Um, Mr. Babar, the AIML techniques, AIML tools that we use for now, I'll tell you in the back end, I'm not directly involved with that team, but I do work constantly with them on certain uh, certain solutions. Uh, for, for the beginning, uh, they use simple Python scripts. Now I'm saying Python scripts, but the libraries that they use in Python for those AIML, I'm not aware of that. They, they, they use some advanced libraries in there and their Python codes are something which are very, very neat. So, uh, but Jupyter Notebook, uh, you can download Anaconda. It's freeware available. Just download that. Have, you have Jupyter Notebook in there. You can use Spider. I, I loved Spider. Many people use Jupyter Notebook. Go in there and there are free resources available online. 
where you can see how to implement those AI ML techniques and what libraries to use in there. Um, just keep in mind, AI ML is a tool. It's not the solution. And that's a problem nowadays with the industry. People think that, oh, I'm going to apply AI ML and I'm going to solve everything in my life. That will never happen. AI ML is a tool, just like you, uh, you, you, you have a calculator in your hand. If I give you a calculator, you're not going to solve the entire problem, problem statement in your exam, right? I mean, you still need to use your brain. You need, still need to use a pen and paper. It's just like pen and paper, it's just a tool. So AI ML is just a tool, just keep in mind. It may give you some very obvious result as well. And that has happened with many companies. People use AI ML techniques on safety and the result it gave back was always wear a hard hat on the drilling rig. Like people are like, seriously, I spent $1 million on AI ML tools and this is the result it's giving me. Use hard hats. We are using hard hats. Uh, Mr. Ibrahim, you asked a question. So without data, we cannot set digital processes. I would say yes. Data is the first thing you need to start any digital process. Data is everything nowadays in this world. If everything is data. Everything, each and everything. What I'm talking right now, these slides, to some company, this is data. How many slides I gave you, how much time I spent in talking, how much time I spent in interacting. So that's, this is a, this is very, everything is data nowadays. So yeah, without data, uh, setting up a digital process will be extremely hard, extremely hard. Do you think new technology of drilling called pulsed plasma drilling technology can replace the common drilling method that is being used today? Uh, I, I'll be honest here. I have read about pulsed plasma drilling technology. Uh, I've heard well, it from, that, uh, from the aspect of, I've read some, I've reviewed some papers on it as a peer reviewer. Uh, it's an interesting technology. I think the people are also using laser along with that, pulsed plasma well, laser, I'm not about about that as well. But um, I, I'm not sure whether it will replace the common drilling method. It can replace the common drilling method from the point of view for hard formations, if I'm not wrong. For granite drilling, for very hard formations, that might be a good replacement. Um, implementing a new technology, think of it also from conventionality point of view. Okay. Uh, we all know, uh, like having a a hydrogen car might be a good hydrogen fueled car might be a good thing, but uh, how hydrogen is not conventional, it's not available everywhere. How will you supply hydrogen everywhere? So that's a big thing. How will you bring pulsed plasma drilling technology to every drilling rig in the world? That's not easy to do. Those, those tools will be expensive. So money, conventionality is a big thing. Uh, idea is important to avoid, avoid damage or know the damage. Ah, that's a... Uh, Excellent question, Ms. Asma. It's a, it's, it, I think it's like a circular loop question that you have asked me. And the chicken and egg thing, what came first, chicken or the egg? So should I, can I avoid the damage or should I know the damage? I would start with the fact that since you are in college right now, since Ms. Asma, you're in college, all of you are in college right now, you first need to know the damage. You, you first need to know what is the problem that I have to understand. What is the problem? When someone says, I have a stuck pipe situation, what does it actually mean? What do you mean by stuck pipe? First of all, if you understand that damage, then you can ask the questions, okay, what can I do to stop it? Or what can I do to prevent the caving? Or what can I do to prevent this particular situation? What, how can I forecast this? Can I prevent it up early? Can I do something earlier so those are the questions that should come to your mind i think so for in your case i would say it's to know the damage and then to avoid the damage and for my case i guess uh, with a little bit of experience a tiny little experience that i have i would say uh i i'll right now like work on ideas to avoid that damage completely because i may know that damage a little bit more than you do right now so, uh so how to use the data for digital processes now ibrahim that's a very uh, i have to be honest it's a very open ended question that's an excellent question but it's it's very open ended it's very hard for me to cover up in few minutes um let's say digital process remember digital processes let's say for planning 
okay you are planning for something you you are planning for a well design okay and uh, what data first of all the question is what data do you need to design a well first of all you need the surface or location you need the targets that you want to achieve then you need to design a well trajectory wise that goes the trajectory path that goes from those that surface or location all the way down and covers those two targets or objectives that you want to achieve is that curvature okay or not are you able to achieve the right dog leg severity you guys might have studied in advanced drilling engineering courses where how to build a trajectory what is radius of curvature method what is minimum curvature method these trainings are available later on so you can make precise calculations as to understand how you're going to curve with your drilling string so once you have achieved that where will you set the casing points to set the casing points you need to know the pore pressure is the pore pressure available in digital format or you're looking at just a chart some from somewhere you know like a printed chart of pore pressure and factor pressure so in this way as you are moving along you are planning a trajectory you are planning a casing policy you are doing a casing design calculation for casing design calculation are you going to write it with hand you guys may have in drilling engineering course you may have done a casing design example how do you digitize that how do you digitize the entire casing design operation in computer in excel file you need a database of all the casings connections joints weights grades hole sizes drift ids you need entire collection of that data then you going to use that to make excel software visual basic python script whatever you want to make a drilling uh, uh, drilling uh, casing design software all right uh, how does real time data monitoring contribute to decision making in critical situations okay so in critical situations um i guess i would say it's in in real time monitoring can help you in understanding the trends so think about it it's so let's say let's say let's take a very common example of driving okay so you're driving uh nowadays the new tesla cars they have this inbuilt machine learning algorithm where it can forecast that you are about to hit the car ahead of you there are men i i drove what i got a corolla few days back i rented it it was the latest model that car also had this inherent feature it had a sensor in front of it which can detect how far the car is which is in front of me and as soon as it got closer to me it immediately applied the brakes so that is a critical situation i could have hit that car directly but the sensor in my car was able to detect that there is a truck up ahead of me 100 feet 70 60 50 40 30 80 immediately applied the brake okay you are getting too close to that truck you might want to slow down so the same goes here um one way is to look at you you are drilling you are looking at the trend yourself so in real time you are looking at the trend what's going on you are monitoring the pressure you are monitoring the hook load you are you are seeing those squiggly lines and trying to make sense out of it and the other way is use a machine learning technique or an ai ml technique which identifies the trend which knows what trend to look for and it can do a better job than your eyes can do so it can be a hybrid approach over there um i hope that answers your question it's a uh, these are big questions it's just that it's hard to answer in such short time uh, technology has made most of our daily tasks easier but why does it stick to oil uh, what is stick to oil and its product well actually um i maybe maybe ms asma can you rephrase your question or can you uh, like maybe uh, uh, ask your question on the phone i didn't get like what do you mean by why does it stick to oil and its products okay maybe uh, let, let me see if i can answer that so uh technology has definitely made our tasks easier but it 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 is changing the life in oil and oil and gas industry as well every day basis there are still many aspects in oil and gas industry which have not changed digitally they are still in the old and the only reason why it has not changed is because oil and gas it's an industry profit making is a big part of it so you need to keep drilling in order to make profit so company in order to transform something digitally completely 
you will, you may have to ask drilling engineers to stop working and designing new wells and then move on to do something else so it becomes very difficult for people to transform everything in one go maybe the technology doesn't exist to gather that amount of data subsurface data is huge geophysical data is huge you need supercomputers to analyze geophysical data not just regular computers so there are a lot of aspects as to why not why isn't every aspect of oil and gas industry gone digital it's really hard to do that because there are just so many aspects there is such huge amount of data that just will not happen i mean it's like saying you have now a uh, new technological advanced uh, cooking utensils in your home where it can heat and it will allow the pressure to release on its own you know we have pressure cookers and it will turn off automatically if it senses the burning but um, why can't you have an automated vegetable chopper that still doesn't exist if you don't have anything that that can chop your veggies automatically uh, do you have any last advice for fashion well okay my last advice is folks there are a lot of things for you to learn out there okay uh, and i know there is a lot of pressure on all of you that you need to learn on uh, uh, you know machine learning techniques and ai techniques and i should learn coding as well python coding and what not and every i should know everything in the world you cannot know everything in the world there is just no limit to what you can learn in the world you will have whole life to learn so i would suggest first focus on what you are doing first focus on your drilling engineering petroleum engineering aspects what you like identify that get an expertise on that get get a good hold on it because when you people graduate you will not be identified as an amazing python coder you will be identified as a petroleum engineer who can code in python you will be identified as a petroleum engineer who also knows machine learning techniques you will be identified as a mach Uh, whatever petroleum engineer who has good management skills because they did an mba course but nevertheless you will always be petroleum engineer unless you want to change the stream completely that's a different point but as a petroleum engineer because you are attending sp talks i have to say like first of all focus on what you are doing and if you know what you are doing then it becomes things become easy then you will be asking the right questions you will have the right mindset while moving ahead Thank you so much, Mr. Anna, for sharing your knowledge and your experience with us. We really appreciate it. So, guys, if there is any other questions, please you can ask. And if in case you don't have any questions, we can end it uh, here and now. So, Mr. Aman, any um, last words from you? Uh I, I think I think Mr. Yakub said it is still important to learn Python right now. If it is not, there is new software for learning. Yeah, so uh, Python is important. It's a very uh, simple language. It's a growing language. Everybody knows it. Everybody loves it. I learned it myself. I learned it on my own. Uh, actually, I, I didn't attend any course. Just I just Googled it and I learned it on my own. It's not that hard. Uh, software wise. i would say don't go into the world of software to learn if you guys have access to edt applications to your university uh, or haliburton or any other company packed many times companies have these university packs and deals to to get software to the to to people uh, don't worry about that too much you you will get exposure to software once you get into that company and you will start learning those software so again to learn that software if you don't even know what trajectory means what casing design means then even if i give you the state of the art casing design software what good is it for you you would have no idea what to do with it because you have no idea what casing design means it's as good as any other thing for you so i guess yeah first of all again like like I said first of all know your stuff know what you are dealing with and then that becomes it becomes very easy for you to translate that information into any digital format software python script javascript whatever you want it doesn't matter i guess that's that's last word for me All right. Thank you so much, everyone. There is nothing else. Uh...